Today we're wrapping up the book of Galatians, and I hope that those of you who have been here and heard these messages have been blessed. And I have really been blessed by uh, studying for these sermons, and uh, um, I, I, you know, never really preached through the book of Galatians before in all my years in the ministry, so it was really a neat experience for me. Verses 11 through 18 of chapter 6. Galatians 6, 11 through 18. I titled the message today, Whose brand do you wear? <laughs> See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in, in, uh, in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither in circumcision Neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. For those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for you, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Before the World Series, the news was making a big deal out of the fact that all these sports shops were running out of Cubs material. <laughs> they, they couldn't keep it on the shelves because everybody wanted some. The Cubs brand was hot for a good reason. They actually got rid of the goat and they won. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Millions are spent on marketing brands every year. And if you've been watching TV at all lately, you see all the advertisements for Christmas stuff. You know, go out and buy this for your kids, or uh, this is going to be the best present of the year. They're, they're making, uh, making all this come into your living room because they're wanting their brand to stick, so you'll buy it. Around here, I know there are a lot of you who are proud to wear Notre Dame. Maybe not so much this year, but, you know, I see it a lot. And some of you are proud to wear Michigan, although after yesterday, maybe not so much. But, you know, the things that people really uh, are proud of, they, they, they wear, okay? Uh, what's your favorite sports team? You know, who's your favorite NASCAR driver? Uh, what are you really passionate about? The things that you're passionate about, you're, you're proud to, to show other people. You know, you're proud to wear their memorability and all that kind of thing. When you're passionate about something, you want other people to know it. And so you show it. A, a young muscular man on a construction crew was bragging about how he could outwork everybody else on the site. And he was making fun, especially of one older worker. After several minutes, the older worker finally had had enough of his, his being ribbed by this young, young whippersnapper. And so he, uh, he said, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? And so he said this, I bet you a week's wage that I can haul something in a wheelbarrow over to the supply shed that you can't haul back. And so the young guy said, you're on, old man, you're on. So the old worker grabbed the wheelbarrow by the handles, and he turned to the young bragger and he said, get in. <laughs> <laughs> so he hauled the young guy over to the, to the shed, but the guy couldn't wheel himself back to the wheelbarrow. So the old timer, Got a week's wages from the young kid. So we have to be careful when we're boasting. 
Yep, might come back to bite us like it did this guy. Has boasting ever got you into trouble? <laughs> Where you uh, you were trying to make yourself look really good to somebody and <laughs> the cat got out of the bag and the truth became no. <laughs> well, how about in the spiritual realm? Have you ever told somebody what a great Christian you were and then <laughs> found out you weren't that great? Have you ever been a hypocrite? <laughs> or you told somebody that, you know, something, something Christian and then you did just the opposite. Let's look at this paragraph, the final paragraph in the book of Galatians, verses 11 through 18. See what it can teach us today. The last paragraph is important because it's a conclusion. You know, everybody likes to get to the conclusion because they know the preacher's about to quit <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's time to go eat and, and it's time to go home. Well, this last paragraph is important because it's a conclusion. It's a conclusion to the book of Galatians. It's a conclusion to the things that Paul is trying to get across to these, these Christians in Galatia. Verse 11 tells us that Paul wrote with his own hand in large letters. Now, Paul generally didn't write his own books. He dictated them to somebody else who wrote them down. But here in this last paragraph, he's taking out the pen himself and writing in large, bold letters. Why was that? Why did he do that? Well, we could go back to what we talked about in an earlier sermon about maybe his thorn in the side was his bad eyesight. But even if that's not the case, he, he did it for, I think, even another reason. I think he felt compelled to stop dictating and start writing to say, listen to this, <laughs> you know, listen to this. It was like a big warning sign. He wanted the people to make sure they got this last paragraph of this book he had been dictating. In other words, he was saying, you better pay attention to this. It's that important. In these few brief words, he summarizes his argument for the whole book. He's contrasting the gospel with the position that these Judaizing false teachers had tried to influence the Christians in the Galatian area. The conclusion that Paul writes is quite effective. Nothing gives away more completely than the things we take pride in. And Paul was taking pride in the fact that not all these Galatian Christians were giving in to the false teachers. The truth is, I think by nature, we all want to be the best at something. And we all want to get noticed by others in something that we're doing. And even in religion, we like to brag about it, I think, sometimes. So Paul was saying that it's important that we pay attention and that we understand that it's the gospel that's really important and not these things that the false teachers are teaching. This last paragraph is also important because it is a warning. Verses 12 and 13 are warnings about Paul's enemies, the false teachers. He makes four accusations against these Judaizers, and it's not really easy to see these until you start studying them a little bit. But these, these false teachers were trying to seduce the people away from God, away from the gospel, away from the truth. The first reason Paul mentions is they were boasting because they wanted to look good to the officials back in Jerusalem. You know, they left Jerusalem once in Galatia to try to win back all these Christians to Judaism. And they wanted to look good back home. And so they were boasting about that. And they were talking uh, talking up the fact that these, these Christians, you know, needed to become Jews again. The 
second thing Paul talks about these false teachers is that they were they had boastful pride and because they were wanting to report to the Jewish leaders large numbers you know I was kind of guilty of that when I was a youth minister I wanted to you know I, I wanted everybody to see what a great youth minister I was and so you know there was a real temptation there to inflate your youth group numbers in your church uh, newsletter. So everybody else in the Brotherhood that saw your your newsletter, they thought, boy, he must be doing a great work there. When that, in essence, you know, it maybe not wasn't true at all. So they wanted to wanted big numbers to get back to Jerusalem to the big shots back there. In fact, it, it seems that there was some pressure on these false teachers to produce big when they, when they got back home, they, they would maybe get some prize or some reward, you know, be the top seller of Avon or be the top seller of real estate or whatever and get their name in the paper and all that kind of stuff. The third reason Paul is uh, talking about the accusations against these uh, false teachers was that he says they were cowards. They were cowards because... They were seducing the Gentile Christians away from the gospel, getting them to turn back to keeping the law, and they weren't even keeping the law themselves. So he says, you guys are just a bunch of cowards. You're not even doing what you're saying. They should do. They were being hypocritical. The fourth thing Paul says against them was not only were they cowards, but they were hypocrites. Because Paul says they weren't even keeping the law themselves. They were just telling people to keep the law. And you, you guys know how that goes. You know, uh, you tell your kids to do something and you haven't done it yourself. But they, they can pick up on that pretty easily. Paul really had nothing good to say about these false teachers who went out to, to spiritually seduce these Galatian Christians and, and get them back into keeping the old ways, the old laws, and be circumcised themselves. They were only doing this for their own selfish purposes. And I think... The warning is that we need to make sure that our worship and that our going to church and our trying to live for Christ each day is for the right reason and not just to make, our, make us look good. Because God knows our heart. And so if we're being a hypocrite or if we're being a coward, we're just trying to be boastful and proud. God's going to know that. Well, the last paragraph is also important because it talks about priority. Galatians 6, verses 14 and 15 talk about the importance of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that should be top priority. That should be the main thing. How we boast about Christ tells how important He is to us. You know? It, it tells the kind of relationship we have with Him. You know, if if he's not really that important, if we, if we keep him in the closet until on Sunday, we put on our church clothes, then don't have him on during the rest of the week. That, that's telling where our priorities really are. The false teachers were boasting about keeping the laws and about how many Gentiles they were getting circumcised and brought back to the law. But Paul was not boasting about that. Paul was not boasting about how many converts he had. He was not boasting about his preaching of the gospel. He was just simply boasting in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's Paul's boast. See, it wasn't about Paul. It was about Jesus Christ. That's all he would boast about. That's why he wrote about it. It was absolutely clear whose brand Paul wore. You know, if, if they would have had shirt shops back then, he would have probably wore a big Jesus across his chest. Because <laughs> that's what he was boasting about. That's the only thing he was really boasting about. That was his priority. And this last paragraph makes that pretty clear. Well, the last paragraph also is important because it's a blessing. The gospel is called a rule. That's kind of interesting. The gospel is a rule. Verse 16. Paul says, those people who walk or live by this rule 
They're going to be blessed. They're going to have peace. They're going to have mercy. They are going to be the real Israel. And the whole point of the false teachers was, you know, you need to follow law and you need to be circumcised because, you know, you're the children of Abraham. Paul says, no, no, he's, that, that's not what makes you children of Abraham. Paul's point was that the gospel made you the children of Abraham, heirs of the promise. You didn't have to go back to keeping the laws and circumcision to be the children of Abraham. And if you remember, Abraham was counted as righteous way before the law even came. That was Paul's argument earlier in the book. Because Paul was faithful to the gospel, he bore on his body the brain marks of Jesus, verse 17 says. What are the brand marks of Jesus? Well, Paul used this word because the Galatians would have understood it. Remember now, the Galatians were Gentiles. Many of them were slaves. Okay? And so, as a slave, a slave was often branded in some way. That branding was a mark that they were owned by a master, and that mark said which master was their owner, who, they, who their master was. So Paul, in using this, this idea of having a brand mark for Jesus, if you got one, then he's your master. Do you have one? You wear the brand marks for Jesus? You better if you call yourself one. The marks on Paul's body were from many, many of the times he had suffered, he had been beaten, he'd been rocked to sleep a couple times. If you want to look at those, 2 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. Paul wore the brand marks of Jesus proudly because they showed evidence that no matter what happened, <laughs> he was faithful. He was faithful to the Lord. That's why, you know, he could tell Timothy, hey, I've, I've finished the course. I've been found faithful. My race is nearly over. And I've followed the Lord all the way. Do you have any scars for being a Christian? Do you have any brand marks of the Master in your life? The very last verse of this chapter, Paul calls the Galatians brethren. He wanted to remind them again that even though they were being tempted to follow the false teachers, he still considered them brethren. He still loved them. He wanted them to know that. Paul ends this book in verse 18 by talking about the theme of the book, grace. He says that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He does not say, may the law be with you. <coughs> Paul hammers home the theme of Galatians one last time so that these Galatian Christians know that it's the grace of God that saved them and not the law or not the fact that they've been circumcised. An active, dedicated, hard-working church member passed away and after a long, satisfying life, he, he approached the pearly gates. He noticed a sign posted on the gate that read, Entrance Requirement, 1,000 Points. When St. Peter appeared, the man asked him, how do you accumulate all those points? And Peter, Peter asked, well, what have you done? And why do you feel like you should be admitted? 
The old man answered with enthusiasm, I was immersed into Christ, and I was 32 years a Christian. And I didn't miss Sunday school for 14 years straight. Wonderful, replied Peter. That's worth one point. Then the man gulped a little bit anxiously over the fact he thought that should be worth more than one point. And he said, well, I, and I tithed. More than that, I, I served on the finance committee, the building committee. I was an elder in the church and, and a member of the board of trustees. If there was a fellowship supper, they could count on me. I set up chairs and tables and I, I even painted some of the church walls, ran errands for the preacher. He looked expectantly at St. Peter thinking, well, that's got to be worth several points. Peter said, fine, fine, that's worth one more point. The man was perspiring now and he said, I recruited many people for our church. I took the kids to church camp in my own car. And it was always available for transportation for anybody who needed to ride. I gave strong support to the missions program of our church too. Wonderful, Peter said. That's another point. Now the man had three points. Futility showed on his face. And he said, that entrance requirement is awfully tough. Why, well, I, don't, I don't believe anyone could ever get in here without the grace of God. And Peter said, exactly. That's worth 997 points. <laughs> and so he let him in. It's all about God's grace. That's what saves us. The gospel that Paul preached was a gospel that brought Paul a lot of hardship. But he continued to preach it because it was the truth. And it was the only way people were going to know about the grace of God. And so we've reached that point in the service today where it's time to decide whether we're going to do something with God's grace or not. So we're going to sing an invitation to them. And it's an opportunity for us to decide, well, do we accept God's grace? Do we believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life? There's no other way to be saved but by Him. I hope you believe that. If you do, we invite you to come and stand and sing.